back to the channel. On today's episode, I'm going to be going over some of the items that I purchased at the last auction where I got the deer head. If you remember, I got a box um, from two different box lots that I purchased from the lady that only one of the, there were deer antlers in both of the box lots. So I was able to purchase the smaller lot for $10. And then that lot were the turkey legs, some hunting brochures and vintage hunting club patches. When I got home, uh, the first thing that I did was that I looked up the, what I thought were hunting brochures. So here they are, if you remember them. They're called Sportsman's Maps, and they're for different districts in Pennsylvania. When I looked closer at these, the first thing that I noticed is that they are made by the Hammer Mill Paper Company, which is in Erie, Pennsylvania. What also is interesting is on the back, to let you know that it was made by a paper company. They even tell you the type of paper. Uh, this was printed by Offset on hammer melt text opaque, uh, radiant white, substance 80, luster finish. So these are maps, they're not really brochures. They're, I guess it's map slash brochure, but they're different than what I thought they'd be. I thought it would just show you where to find, you know, deer, fox, bear, but it's not like that at all. It's even better. So again, these are for different districts in Pennsylvania around the Erie portion of the state. And they were made by the Hammer Mill Paper Company to actually encourage the public to come out and experience the vast land that Hammer Mill owned. The brochure states that Hammer Mill Company owned and actively operated approximately 160,000 acres of hardwood forest land in Northwestern Pennsylvania and in southwestern New York. The primary purpose of this ownership is to ensure a continuing availability of hardwood fiber for its paper mill at Erie, Pennsylvania. So this specific map, it's different for each district. This map covers um, and locates 43,200 acres of company ownership in the Warren, Forest, Venego, and Crawford counties. And then Hammer Mill Paper states that it is our pleasure here at Hammer Mill to invite you to use these lands for all lawful recreation activities, such as hunting, fishing, hiking, and sightseeing. To this end, we sincerely wish you a most enjoyable adventure in the pursuit of your favorite pastime. So if you open up, it up, it actually is a map of this specific county. And it has a map legend these large white areas are state game lands. These smaller little white areas that are numbered, um, they're down here, but these are the company ownership. So this is where the company would have forested. Then also on the map, you have you know locations of deer, these little trailers. I'm not sure if you could see. The little trailers represent where you could camp with a trailer. And then they also have swimming sites, skiing, and then a golf course. Hmm. I'm not sure if you can see, but here's a little skier by Youngsville. Then you have a fish. And then up here is a little, it's a little golfer. So the hammer mill put this out for the public. And they also gave a nice little write up about forest management. Um, Hammer Mill Paper was founded in the late 1800s and they were in operation until around the 1980s when they were purchased by I believe what is called the International Paper Company. So they were a you know a large staple in the paper industry. When you hear Hammer Mill, you you know what they're what people are talking about. Whether it's you know paper that you purchase for your own use at home, paper at the office. Hammer Mill is a big name. They were developed or founded by three brothers and their father. And so it stayed in the family for quite some time. But here at Hammer Mill, they talk about forest management and the importance of the trees for Hammer Mill paper. And then they even, they talk about how they manage their forest, about, um, they discuss land that had been cut and harvested. They say that it was under the supervision of the harvesters. And then in their point of view, they're saying that you'll see certain conditions are beneficial to the wildlife habitat. Sound and vigorous trees are left in the stand and these generally will produce the greatest abundance of seed food for a great variety of wildlife. 
Small to medium-sized openings are created in the forest, which will enhance the growth of low-level vegetation to be used by wildlife for food and cover. An overabundance of deer can cause tremendous destruction to young trees. This imbalance not only complicates forest management, but results in poor trophies and smaller deer. The sportsmen should become factually informed of the present deer population and support the Game Commission in its efforts to manage scientifically this important wildlife asset. They talk about the vegetation, how, you know, where they put in roads and bridges, which are designed to slow down runoff and reduce soil erosion, et cetera, and how they um, encourage people to come out and use the lands for hunting, fishing, hiking, limited camping, and all lawful recreational activities. They only ask for your cooperation in helping to keep the lands green and litter free. They also offer some what was it some safety rules which i think shows a lot about how far we've come as a nation in technology and just people in general um, some of them are number two be sure you want to kill what you were aiming at um, be careful with matches we all know that be sure to tell someone where you plan to go hunting and fishing um, be sure to leave a phone number at home so that you can be reached in case of an emergency. Be sure to carry a compass if you are traveling in strange county and country. If you get lost, don't panic. A smoke signal or three shots indicates distress. Or you could just pick up your cell phone and now call someone. Though I know in some of those areas, you know, the signal isn't bad, but I think even just these safety rules shows a lot about where we have come so far in technology. But it's just interesting that a company would encourage people to come on the lands. You know, granted, Hammermill didn't own this whole district, but to allow people onto their property to hunt or to camp and just enjoy nature and wildlife. I'm not sure if many companies would do that today just for the idea of, you know, people being on company-owned land, if there are any accidents, etc. I don't know if Hammer Mill still does this, being that they were bought out. So the new company that owns this property, you know, I can't say. I'm sure there are all sorts of different rules that have gone into effect now. But these are pretty interesting. Online on eBay, there is one map. It's a district that I don't have, but they had it up for, I think it was $16.99 or best offer with free shipping. And when I looked, I was the fourth viewer to the listing. So there's not a huge demand for these. So I might put it on eBay or I might just bring it to my local flea market and sell them for a couple bucks a piece or bundle it all together. It's just neat history, not only for hunting, um, but also for the Hammer Mill Paper Company as well. So with that, I also had these patches, which I showed you. Um, we have the Nebo Hunting Lodge Ink Patch and then a Hamburg Rifle and Pistol Club patch. There are a few of these online, not for Hamburg, but for other different counties. You know, this is gonna be probably a, a long-term sale. It's gonna take someone that wants this specific patch to go online and find it. I doubt if I list it, you know, it's gonna be bought within a day, but we'll see. This patch I'll probably keep for myself. Berks County Trap Shooters League, amateur. I just like the look of it. I might sew it on a bag, a book bag. Um, we'll see. Now, the other items that I bought that I'm sure that you remember are the taxidermy turkey legs. These I purchased because I just thought that they were neat looking and I figured someone out there would want them. I didn't look them up beforehand. I just bought them, again, because I thought they were neat. So when I did come home and look them up on eBay, you know, taxidermy does fairly well. I know that there are a lot of people that are against taxidermy um, for various reasons, but those that collect taxidermy, that study how taxidermy has changed throughout the years, you know, they like to purchase these things um, to add to their collection for various reasons. So looking online, these actually do pretty well, but there was more than just looking up how much money they bring in. It was Interesting to know why they bring in a certain amount of money and just learning about the legs in general. These are from a wild turkey. And what I learned that I found was the neatest thing that I had no idea is that these little items here, these little claws are called spurs. And this is actually how you can tell the age of a turkey. 
up to a year, I believe, if a spur is half inch or less, that's how you know that the turkey is around a year old. When a turkey gets to be two years old, it can grow to an inch. After that, when they start to hit the three-year-old mark is when this spur goes and becomes very sharp and then also starts to curve and has a hook. You know, this isn't a foolproof way, foolproof way to tell because they could have gotten hurt, injured. You know, they use these a lot for dominance, if they're walking, you know, anything. But that's one of the, one of the ways that they can tell how old a turkey is by the spur. So people online that collect and buy these types of things, they buy them for the color of the skin, but then also for the spur. There was one listing that looks very similar to this pair that I have, but the spur was like a, an actually very pretty like opaque white. And that listing went for almost $67 and it had about six, five or six bitters on it for a pair of turkey legs. But again, they were, you know, it's weird to say that they were pretty, but they were, and the spurs were, were very interesting and neat. So when I list these online, I will list them with the color, and then I will also measure the spur. Now I have this guy here. As you can see, his spur is pretty much just a little nub. That was another interesting fact. The spurs, on a female bird, the spurs stop growing I want to say after the two year mark, I might be wrong. It could be the one year mark. I think it was a two year mark. So if you have a super long spur, it's most likely a male because again, the female spurs, they, they stop growing. The male spurs will keep growing. But as you can see, the spur on this guy is not very large or girl is not very large. It's pretty much a nub. Now they could have gotten injured. Who knows what have happened? But if we're going by how to tell an age, this bird wouldn't have been very old. I also bought these. These were in the box lot as well. Um, these I think belong to a grouse. There are many that were listed online that still had the hair attached. This isn't a pair. Um, they're just kind of odds and ends. So for Halloween, I like to decorate with odd things. And so I might add these to my Halloween collection. We'll see. So when I was looking up, the turkey legs, besides being under taxidermy, what I was surprised to find is that many of the listings have the word voodoo attached to the title between voodoo and crafting. We know now crafting, you know, it's gotten on an, an upswing again. People craft with all sorts of different things. So that really shouldn't have been a surprise to me. But voodoo, I had no idea. Um, I didn't look up what people use these for in voodoo. I would like to assume maybe casting spells, or if they need, you know, a spur of a turkey leg, that's what they would buy it for. Again, there are buyers out there for everything. So whether it's taxidermy collectors, voodoo people, or crafters, turkey legs seem to be popular. So I will list this pair. I might just list this other guy singly. We'll let, we'll, we'll see. Or I could add them to my Halloween decorations as well. I'm still doing research on the Boswick poster that I purchased. That company is, seems to be a little bit hard to find items on. It looks like they were developed in, again, the late 1800s or early 1900s. I found a really neat old brochure catalog online that talked about the architecture of New York City and how they started using the Boswick metal in their buildings because it um, had a higher fireproof grading than some of the other metals. And so they wanted to use Boswicks to ensure that their population would be safe in the buildings around the city. So once I finish doing my research on that poster, then I will let you guys know. I always like to find not only the history of the items, but if I could put faces to names. So a lot of times in these old catalogs, they'll have you know a picture of the president of the company or maybe a a snapshot of the workers in the company. Um, so that, that's pretty cool to see. So I'll keep working on that. And then once that's finished, I'll probably make a little video just to show you some more information about the Boswick Metal Lathe Company out in Niles, Ohio. But.